Welcome to Usability and Human Factors Decision Support Systems, a Human Factors Approach. This is Lecture A. In this lecture, we will discuss an important topic to usability in Human Factors Decision Support Systems, DSS, a Human Factors Approach. Decision support systems have been used in a variety of industries, including finance, transportation, and public works since the 1970s. It had its beginnings in health since the late 1950s, but became a more active area of research and development in the mid-1970s. With the growing penetration of clinical information systems, DSS is an effective vehicle for providing real-time guidance to clinicians. DSS includes lower technology solutions such as paper-based guidelines. However, we will focus on computer-based clinical decision support systems, CDSS, and computerized provider order entry systems. In this lecture, we will focus on the basics of human decision making. The objectives for this unit, Decision Support Systems, a Human Factors Approach, Lecture A, are to describe the cognitive basis for decision making and its effect on clinical errors. Patient safety has increasingly become a focal concern of all stakeholders in the healthcare enterprise. You have been introduced to the landmark Institute of Medicine report titled To Air is Human, which detail the extraordinary number of preventable deaths that are attributable to human error. Adverse drug events, or ADEs, defined as any harm that results from medication, whether due to an adverse drug reaction or medical error, are estimated to injure or kill almost three quarters of a million people in hospitals every year. There are significant complexities in medication management which pose substantial risk for hospitalized patients and a non-negligible risk for ambulatory care patients. We can characterize several phases of the medication delivery process, prescribing, dispensing, administration, and monitoring. Each of these phases provides opportunities for confusion, miscommunication, and error. You may have been introduced to the concept of human factors in several lectures. The focus is on human beings and their interactions with products, equipment, tasks, and environments. The broad goal is to design systems and system components to match the capabilities and limitations of humans who use them. The process we are concerned with is decision making. Making decisions is something that every human being routinely does. Some decisions have greater importance than others. The study of decision making has been a focal concern of cognitive psychology research for more than 60 years. We can characterize three components of decision process. First, choice options and courses of actions. Second, beliefs about objective states processes, and events in the world, including outcome states and means to achieve them. This reflects our understanding of the state of affairs and the means to change them. And third, the desires, values, or utilities that describe the consequences associated with the outcomes of each action event combination. Some outcomes are more satisfactory than others, and some risks are more consequential than others. In simple terms, good decisions are those that effectively choose means that are available in a given situation to achieve the individual's goals. As we will discuss, clinical decision support systems, or CDSS, can transform the means to shape decisions in achieving an individual's goals. There are two main areas of work in the medical decision-making research. The first involves an understanding of how decisions are made. The second involves the means to facilitate and improve the decision-making process in order to improve patient outcomes. In the next few slides, we will focus on the first objective, understanding how decisions are made. Following that, 
we will concentrate largely on issues related to the second objective, how to facilitate and improve the decision-making process. It is not surprising that humans are fallible reasoners and flawed decision-makers. We routinely see how society's professional decision-makers like judges, politicians, and coaches make poor decisions. The heuristics and biases approach was pioneered by Tversky and Kahneman, who for many years worked to understand the nature of human decision-making. Heuristics are rules of thumb that we routinely use for making decisions. They tend to be intuitive and rapid, but can be error-prone. Biases are systematic deviations from normative standards they can significantly impact the process of decision-making and have been well-documented in the context of health-related decisions by clinicians as well as patients. There are several well-documented biases, including hindsight and confirmation bias. Cognitive heuristics are mental processes by which we learn, recall, or process information. These processes are often unconscious and may lead to systematic and serious error, similar to optical illusions. Examples of cognitive heuristics are representativeness, availability, and anchoring and adjustment. The first cognitive heuristic we will look at is the representativeness heuristic. Think of a patient who is having a heart attack. What type of a patient might come to mind? Perhaps you might visualize a middle-aged, overweight man who smokes cigarettes. However, this patient is an old woman who is not grossly overweight. The tendency is the clinician will compare how similar this case is to their mental image of others with the same disease. However, difficulties occur when the disease or situation is rare, very low prior probability or prevalence when the clinician's previous experience is biased or atypical, or when, as in this case, the patient's clinical presentation is atypical. Another cognitive heuristic is the availability heuristic. This states that our estimate of the probability of an event is influenced by the ease with which we remember similar events and we remember dynamic, atypical, or emotion-laden events more easily. The problem is that this is often misleading and, as a result, we are likely to overestimate their probability. For example, if a physician saw a patient who had a swollen leg and the patient then died of a blood clot, pulmonary embolism due to deep vein thrombosis, then the physician may overestimate the probability of a clot in everyone who has a swollen leg. Other causes of swollen legs will not be considered. A third common cognitive heuristic is the anchoring and adjustment heuristic. Physicians will make an initial estimate of the probability of a diagnosis, such as a heart attack, and then will adjust the probability when new information is received such as laboratory tests. The usual mistake is that, in light of new information, the probability that the patient has given disease is adjusted too late. Now let's look at biases. Decisions, especially those that were mistakes, seem very transparent after the fact. When one reviews the errors of a family member, friend, or colleague, the situation seems so obvious. In fact, when errors are analyzed after the fact, blaming a culprit seems to be the clear thing to do. This kind of thinking is a product of hindsight bias. This occurs when decision makers inflate the probability of a prior judgment, e.g. diagnose a patient, on the basis of subsequent available information. There have been numerous studies documenting hindsight bias. One such study provided clinicians with a set of cases on paper and asked them to rate the probability of a given diagnosis. When they were told the actual diagnosis in advance of the case, their probability judgments were significantly higher. The important point is that the probabilities should always be the same given the set of facts such as patient's symptoms and laboratory findings. 
the inflated probabilities are a product of hindsight bias. So, what does all this mean? Well, biases have consequences for present and future decision making. If physicians assume they would have predicted a clinical outcome, they may fail to learn from a case. Unusual or noteworthy cases may seem more mundane because they can appear less unusual after the facts are known. We also talked about error attribution. If the answer seems obvious, then it is easy to overlook a host of mitigating factors that may resurface and lead to more serious errors. Confirmation bias is something that we are all guilty of from time to time. If we have already made up our minds, we are less receptive to the possibility that our decision choice is wrong. We may fail to attend to or ignore the evidence. Overconfidence in one's judgment causes the decision maker to favor one hypothesis over another. We may selectively attend to data and not give adequate weight to alternative possibilities. One finding in medical decision making is that clinicians are prone to order laboratory tests that may yield no new information about the patient's state. They may merely serve to confirm one's prior hypothesis. There is ample evidence to suggest that clinicians experience difficulty engaging in probabilistic reasoning. In particular, the application of Bayes' theorem, which is used to calculate the probability of a disease given a positive test result, has been problematic. Eddy's classic study is an interesting case in point. He presented clinicians with the following problem. Estimate the probability that a woman has breast cancer given that she has a positive mammogram on the basis of the following information. The probability that a patient has breast cancer is 1%. This provides the prior probability. If the patient has breast cancer, the probability that the radiologist will correctly diagnose it at 80%. This provides the sensitivity or hit rate. And if the patient has a benign lesion or no breast cancer, the probability that the radiologist will misdiagnose, it is 9.6%. This provides the false positive rate. According to Bayes' theorem, the probability that this patient has breast cancer is about 8%. Eddy found that 95 out of 100 physicians estimated that the probability of breast cancer after a positive mammogram to be around 75%, a highly inflated value. The test result and its sensitivity seem to be the most salient feature and the base rate is largely ignored. The deviation between individuals' responses and the normative response, as indicated by Bayes' theorem, are explained by a bias in which the clinician selectively attends to certain variables that are salient and ignores others such as base rates. Biases are, more generally, predispositions to reason in ways that are not consistent with probability theory. The framing effect refers to the fact that alternative representations of a problem can give rise to different judgments and preferences. Preference for a particular course of action is different when a problem is posed in terms of potential gain rather than potential loss, even though the underlying situation is identical. On the next slide, we will provide an example. For example, when a cancer patient is given a prognosis in terms of survival years, the perception is different from probability of mortality. The difference is just in the presentation, not in the substance. McNeil et al. 1986 presented a hypothetical lung cancer decision scenario to physicians and patients. One treatment option was radiation therapy, which had an immediate higher survival and lower mortality rate, but a lower five-year survival rate. The other treatment option was surgery. There were two frames for explaining the problem. Frame 1, treatments were described in terms of survival rates. Frame 2, 
treatments were described in terms of mortality rates. McNeil found that subjects in the survival frame expressed a clear preference for surgery. In the mortality frame, the two choices were preferred almost equally. One possible explanation is that the positive framing leads to more risk-averse choices, while the negative framing increases risk-seeking decision-making. The previously described research on decision-making has largely been done in laboratory contexts and not in real-world settings. It is important to keep in mind that decision-making in naturalistic settings can take on a certain character. Decisions are embedded in a broader social context and involve multiple players. Decisions are best thought of as decision-action cycles rather than discrete decisions. In clinical settings, there may be a steady volume of patient-related information and there may be multiple sources or streams. The goals may be ill-defined at times and may change, for example, as the patient's state changes. In a given setting, there may be substantial stress and time pressure. Of course, there are multiple players including various physicians, nurses, and other personnel. This requires coordination of decisions and actions. This concludes Introduction to Decision Making, Decision Support Systems, A Human Factors Approach, Lecture A. To summarize, heuristics used for decision making tend to be intuitive and rapid, but can be error prone. Decisions in naturalistic studies are embedded in a broader social context and involve multiple players. Computer-based decision support systems offer great promise for facilitation of superior patient care.